Good evening, everyone. Welcome to a New Jersey Constitution Republicans perspective. Tonight, we're going to be discussing Article 5 and a call for a convention of the states. Article 5, calling a convention for proposing amendments. This presentation is intended to help educate those who may not be aware of the Convention of the States or the arguments for and against a calling for a convention for proposing amendments. And so we will begin with our presentation. And I thank you for joining me this evening. We were originally scheduled for seven, but uh, we backed it up until eight o'clock. And we will move through this presentation. And if you have any questions, please uh, record them or write them down and we will address them at the end of this presentation. Uh, you can add them to the comments section and I will read them as we are able to do so at the conclusion of this presentation. And so we will begin with our Article 5, calling a convention for proposing amendments. Anyone who would like to get a copy of this PowerPoint presentation, they can send an email asking for the presentation and you can utilize it and use it um, at your pleasure. Hopefully you will inform others and help to educate others on this call for a convention for proposing amendments, the Article 5 calling for a convention for proposing amendments. And all you have to do is simply email me at njcr4restore at gmail.com. That's njcr, the number four, then restore, R-E-S-T-O-R-E, -E, at gmail.com, and I will send you this PowerPoint presentation. United States Constitution, Article 5 says that, quote, the Congress, whenever two thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution or on the application of the legislatures of two thirds of several states shall call a, excuse me, two thirds of the several states shall call a convention for proposing amendments, which in either case shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of this Constitution when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states or by conventions in three-fourths thereof as one or the other mode of ratification may be proposed by the Congress, provided that no amendment which may be made prior to the year 1808, Article 1, Section 9, shall in any manner affect the first and fourth clauses in the ninth section of the first article and that no state without its consent shall be deprived of its equal suffrage in the Senate. So there are two means by which we can amend the Constitution. Number one is the one that we always have exclusively used to propose amendments and add amendments to the Constitution, and that is the fact that the Congress, the federal Congress, has done so uh, whenever two-thirds of the House shall deem it necessary in proposing amendments. Of course, it is not easy to have an amendment passed because of the three-quarter um, qualification. And uh, then you have the other means by which the Constitution gives an opportunity for the um, proposing of amendments, and that is through a con constitutional convention for pro proposing amendments of, through the states. And uh, they after a certain number, after the two thirds, the application of legislatures of two thirds of the several states shall call a convention for proposing amendments, which in either case shall be valid to all intents and purposes. As part of this constitution when ratified by the legislatures of three fourths of the several states or by conventions. States are able to have conventions as well. And three-fourths thereof as one or the other mode of ratification may be proposed by the Congress. Keep in mind that um, language of the mode of ratification may be proposed by the Congress rather than the states. But the states have been engaged in uh, calling for a 
constitutional or a, a convention of the states, you'll see that those two terms are indeed synonymous. Uh, there is no difference in either. And that uh, provided that no amendment which may be prior to the 1,808 shall in any matter affect the first and fourth clauses of the ninth section of the first article. So what do you think that means? What happened in 1808? What did the Constitution, what was the proviso of the, con the initial Constitution that was ratified in 18, or rather 1788, rather, at the con Constitution Convention of Philadelphia? 20 years. There would be a 20-year period, and after the 20 years, the slave trade would end. So they were not going to, by any means, disturb the slave owner's interests in abolishing the slave trade prior to 1808. And that's precisely why that language is in the Constitution. Of course, slavery was an abomination from the very beginning. And there were compromises made with the Southern states to create our union and to create our United States government and to ratify the Constitution and the slave power had their will imposed and that is why slavery was protected in the Constitution. Of course, that all came to naught with the winning of the Civil War by the Republican Party and the Union, led by Abraham Lincoln, and the 13th Amendment forever abolishing slavery in this nation, which nullified that clause or any other clause in the Constitution protecting slavery. Of course, the word slavery is not in the Constitution. They went to great pains to make sure it was not there because they all anticipated, even those in the South, some of those in the South, some of those who were slavers anticipated the gradual abolition of slavery. So there are two phases to the amendment process. Number one is the proposal phase, as which we read which is an amendment to the Constitution is proposed. The proposed amendment must be approved by two thirds of the members of both houses of Congress or two thirds of the states. And then the ratification phase is the proposed amendment must be ratified by three quarter of the states. States can ratify via a vote in their state legislature or a ratifying convention. And then the amendment is now part of the Constitution after the three quarter qualifications are met. And as we have said, the traditional means by which we have enacted and approved amendments to the Constitution have been through the Congress. We've never had a convention, Constitutional Convention of the States. Now, of course, there is a movement, and uh, to have the states, three quarter of the states, are necessary for the Congress, the United States Congress, to then call the, cons the Constitutional or the Constitutional Convention. And this is why it is indeed a Constitutional Convention. What is the difference between a Convention of States and a con Constitutional Convention? None. There's simply none. What is a Constitutional Convention? There is a lot of, um, there has been some though, there have been those who've been saying, well, the Constitution, the, the a convention of states is different than a constitutional convention. Not so. A duly constituted assembly of delegates or representatives of the people of a state or a nation for the purpose of framing, revising, or amending its constitution. That's from the lawdictionary.org, Black's Law Dictionary, which is the most used dictionary for any um, one who is practicing law, anyone who is a lawyer, anyone involved with law. And uh, we clearly see the definition given there by uh, Black's Law Dictionary, and you can read that at that website. And then what does the Convention of States want to do? Well, the answer is to amend the Constitution. What occurred in Philadelphia in 1787, they gave us a new Constitution. And that is the, actually a question. What occurred in Philadelphia in 1787? They gave us a new Constitution. Well, the answer is a constitutional convention or a convention of the states, or the application of the legislatures of two thirds of the several states shall call a convention for proposing amendments. And that is what the legislatures are indeed doing, calling for a convention for proposing amendments. 
Right now, I do believe uh, in doing research today that there are 19 states, 34 will be needed. There are 19 at this time that have agreed to call for a convention and having the Congress call for that convention in Article 5 of the United States Constitution. So they are at 19 and they are very aggressively um, looking for more states to participate so that they can reach um, the 34 state threshold. Now there is some precedence to constitutional convention. And this is important to remember in thinking of how a modern day convention, constitutional convention would um, operate. The Philadelphia Constitutional Convention had been endorsed by the Confederation Congress on fe February 21, 1787. Of course, the Articles of Confederation were the first um, political document or constitution that the uh, founders devised. The original resolution approved by the Confederation Congress was for calling a convention in May 1787 for the sole and express purpose, unquote, of revising the Articles of Confederation. This report would contain alterations and provisions that render, quote, the federal constitution adequate to the exegesis of government and the preservation of the union, unquote. So the idea was in revising the Articles of Confederation, yet the Constitution Convention did more than revise, they created a new constitution with no rules in ratifying it. The Articles of Confederation required unanimous approval from all the states for amendments, and the new Constitution required nine out of 13 states for ratification. So from 100% in agreement and approval to 75%. And the idea of the revision turned into a whole new Constitution. And we're very thankful that that did occur. But don't think that that wouldn't occur again with a constitutional convention or a convention of the states, which are synonymous. So there is precedent here that must be considered. What does the convention of the states want from a constitutional convention? The convention of the states project looks to limit the federal government by number one, imposing fiscal restraints on the federal government limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government and limit the terms of office for officials and for members of Congress. All this despite the constitution having been created to limit the federal government from its exception. As demonstrated in the first three articles, lists of restricted and enumerated duties for each branch of government, article one, two, and three. The constitution already provides with those looking to amend the constitution desire. So the mentality is, so let's amend the constitution because no one abides by it. We all hear this often. Now this reasoning would be, also would lead us to rewriting the Bible and changing the 10 commandments because no one can abide by them. So because no one is abiding by the constitution, we have to amend it. And because no one is abiding by the 10 commandments, are we going to amend the 10 commandments? I think not. The preamble of the Constitution evidences we, the people's aspiration for limited government, right within the preamble of the Constitution. This, was, this is what needs to be taken seriously by our elected representatives. And because we've gotten away from this limited expectations of government, we are in the predicament that we are in today. Six principles encompass the breadth of we, the people of the United States. Number one, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. It's all quite simple. Of course, many have read into the ideas of ensuring domestic quality or providing for the common defense or for promoting the general welfare into expansive programs, subsidizing citizens. The founders never intended for subsidies um, to be given, but for freedom to be given the people to earn their own living, to pursue their own means of happiness, not relying on government for that happiness, but relying on the individual and the individual liberty of each citizen. 
So this is what we need to look back to, and that's the preamble of the Constitution, and get back on track on what the federal government's responsibilities truly are. And they're very, um, they are very broad and rather abstract, but they have been manipulated to create undue and unconstitutional legislation. Article 5, an early Article 5 application. Virginia, November 14, 1788, in New York, seven, uh, New York, February 7, 1789, moved to have another constitutional convention only a year or two after the initial. Why was this? Thomas Jefferson wrote to William Carmichael on December the 26th, 1787, quote, New York has written circular letters to the legislatures to adopt the other mode of amendment provided also by the Constitution, that is to say, to assemble another federation, federal convention. This way, the whole fabric would be submitted to alteration. So another convention in Thomas Jefferson's view would be subjugating the Constitution to alteration, more alteration starting all over again. James Madison wrote to George Lee Tuberville on November the 2nd, 1788, quote, having witnessed the difficulties and dangers experienced by the first convention, which assembled under even propitious circumstances. I should tremble for the result of a second meeting in the present temper of America and under all the disadvantages I have mentioned. The present temper in America right now is very, very different, very much divided, very much led by special interest groups than it was in 1787. And Madison was trembling at the fear of a second convention a year after the first one with all the, the division and the divisiveness. And his day was calm sea still seas, a glass of sea compared to the rumblings and to the tidal waves of division and diverse uh, special interests that would be involved with another constitution at this time. It's not too hard to understand. Later Article 5 applications. Interestingly enough, in 1893, Nebraska became the first state to make an application to Congress to call a convention to propose an amendment replacing the appointment of United States senators by state legislatures with direct election by the people instead. Between 1893 and 1911, a total of 26 states passed similar application, but fell short of the required two thirds. 31 states needed at that time for Congress to call a convention. Now, despite the failure of these states in a convention, the populist and progressive demands for direct democracy in electing senators became the 17th Amendment in 1912 and adopted in 1932 upon the ratification, or excuse me, 1913, upon the ratification of three-fourths of the states, 36 at that time. The 17th Amendment seriously unbalanced the relationship between the federal and state governments established by the founders and known as federalism before the states had a direct voice in federal Congress, which they lost, contributing to further expansion of federal power. The 17th Amendment turned out to be an integral part of converting our constitutional republic into a democracy. New amendments may have unintended consequences that turn out, unfortunately, for future posterity. Another consideration for those proposing another constitutional convention. New amendments may have unintended consequences that turn out, unfortunately, for future posterity. Defects or disobedience. Why amend the Constitution? A clear distinction is made between defects in the Constitution and disobedience to the Constitution from the three branches of government. Now, slavery, as we already discussed, was clearly defect. Article 5, Section 2 says, no person held to service or labor in one state, that is a slave, under the laws thereof, escaping into another, shall, in consequence of any law or regulation therein, be discharged from such service or labor, slavery, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. Interesting enough, they use the word do rather than own, but that is indeed what Article 5, Section 2 of the Constitution is describing. This defect 
was corrected with the passage of the 13th Amendment. Section one says, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. That was the end of slavery. And it took almost a hundred years to do it. The proposals of the Convention of States project impose fiscal restraints on the federal government, limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government, and limit the terms of office for officials and for members of Congress are not caused by deficiencies in the Constitution, but rather disobedience to the Constitution by those elected and non-elected offices that comprise the three branches of government. A clear distinction is made between defects and disobedience. The states are complicit with federal infringements on the Constitution. Those who propose a convention of the states describe the federal government as the all-encompassing evil, and the states are given a pass. The states are given a, a clean slate, if you will. And yet the states are woefully in debt, have disobeyed their state constitutions, have deprived and suspended the state constitutional rights of their citizens. It's not just the federal government. This is what amazes me about those who, who are for convention of states. They're, they're saying, well, the federal government, we're gonna affect that, we're gonna, we're gonna change the federal government, we're gonna. We're going to rein in the federal government. Well, how about the states? The states are complicit. State governments have collaborated with the usurpations of the federal government, quite simply. Now, the 10th Amendment says that the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited by it to the states or reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. The 10th Amendment gave power to the states, which they gave back to the federal government for subsidies, for programs and benefits, from administrative agencies and bureaucracies that have no constitutional authority to exist and are comprised of unelected officials making decisions elected representatives created. The states have given their power away in allowing agencies like Homeland Security, the Department of Education, OSHA, the Environmental Protection Agency, on and on it goes to protect them and to educate their youth, that's what I'm talking about with Homeland Security Department of Education um, under the guise that they are protecting us and they're educating or their youth, these two administrative agencies, which the states have looked to for subsidies. And this is why they've been compromised. New Jersey, for example, has approximately $220 billion in debt that they created on their own, those we've elected, not abiding by the state constitution and continually look to the federal government to help with the liability. 30% of the state revenue comes from the federal government. With federal funds comes federal control. The national debt increases with state dependence on federal dollars. It's all there on the website. We give resources and we give them, we give the sources by which we claim this information to be true. Another thing to consider, my fellow New Jerseyan, is the fact that New Jersey is considered a sanctuary state. They are abrogating federal laws created by the Congress regarding the rules of naturalization. 8 U.S. Code 13, 24, 25, and 26 demand penalty and deportation for those who are illegally and punishment for those who harbor illegal aliens. Yet that's precisely what Phil Murphy and the Democrats have done, abrogating federal law. Who will rein them in? Do we need to call a convention of the state convention to rein in Phil Murphy and the Democrats and their Confederate uh, policy concerning illegal aliens? It is, an act, it is indeed an act of Confederacy. It's a violation of federal law. So is the marijuana laws. Federal law prohibits the use of marijuana. It's not even considered by Phil Murphy and the Democrats that they're again acting as a confederacy against the federal government. So it's not just the federal government that's our problem, my fellow citizens, it's also the states. The Convention of State focuses 
exclusively on amending the Constitution to address federal government irresponsibilities when the states are equally complicit in electing representatives, not adhering to their own state constitutions, accumulating billions in debt, and expanding the force of government with no regard for their state constitutions. State governments are no victims of federal tyranny, but rather just as complicit in violating constitutions. How would a constitutional convention operate? The Convention of the States Project supporters confidently claim that they know exactly how a constitutional convention will operate. The Congressional Research Service in its April 2014 report indicates on page 27, I get this again, the Congressional Research Service in its April 2014 report indica indicates on page 24, quote, in the final analysis, the question, what sort of convention, unquote, is not likely to be resolved unless or until the 34 state threshold has been crossed and a convention assembles. So all of the hyperbole, all of the statements made, this is how this convention of states is going to work. It will work precisely as it it's being described by those who are purporting it. And here we have a report done by the very Congressional Research Service stating that in the final analysis, the question of what sort of convention is not likely to be resolved unless or until the 34 state threshold has been crossed in convention assemblies. From the same report on the summary page, quote, Congress would face a range of questions if an Article V convention seemed likely, including the following. Would constitute a legitimate state application? Does Congress have discretion as to whether it must call a convention? What vehicle does it use to call a convention? Could a convention consider any issue or must it be limited to a specific issue? Could a runaway convention propose amendments outside its mandate? Could Congress choose not to propose a convention approved amendment to the states? What role would Congress have in defining a convention, including issues such as rules of procedure and voting number and apport, apportment, apportionment of delegates, funding and duration, service by members of Congress, and other questions? Under these circumstances, Congress could consult a range of information resources in fashioning its response. Of course, one of them, one of those resources would be indeed the Congressional Research Service and its report on a convention of states. But you can clearly see the numerous questions and more than I have listed here that will not be answered until the 34th state threshold is crossed and the convention actually assembles. You will not know anything. You can put a big question mark up in front of a convention of the states until they assemble. And look at all the questions that have to be answered. Who will be the delegates? What role does Congress have in defining the Constitution, procedures, and voting, the funding and the duration of the convention, the service by members of Congress? What vehicle will it use to call the convention? We've done, never done this before. It's never been attempted. And that's because the amendment process, the first amendment process has worked relatively well, not with all amendments, but the process has worked relatively well. And there've been many hundred amendments, but only 27 exist. And that was what the founders intended for it to be a very, very difficult task in amending the constitution as it should be. A convention of the states opens it up to a whole new world. Now, here are the enumerated responsibilities of Congress, and I'm not gonna read them for you, but I suggest you do this. And I especially suggest that our representatives who are in Washington now read it, and all those who look to be candidates in the future for their congressional districts read it, become very familiar with it. These are the enumerated duties. These are the specific powers of Congress in great detail. These powers are limited to those listed and those that are necessary and proper, as we see um, at the beginning or at the uh, conclusion of this clause. And uh, all other lawmaking powers are left to the state. So these are the various responsibilities of the federal government. Now, if you read these 
responsibilities, you will see that there have been many acts or laws that are not commiserate with these specific duties. Essentially, the duties include taxing, the power of the purse, um, borrowing money, commerce with foreign nations, the uniform rule of naturalization, that is making citizenship, which the state of New Jersey, incidentally, is completely ignored under Democratic leadership and Phil Murphy. And we also have the responsibilities of post offices and roads to promote the progress of science, um, to constitute tribunals inferior to the Supreme Court. Uh, <clears throat> and then it goes into a lot of foreign policy um, responsibilities, one of which is the sole exclusive authority to declare war. And yet we have not had a declaration of war since 1942, June of 1942. But yet we've been involved in Korea, Vietnam. Um, we've been involved in uh, Desert Storm and other, um, the operation in Iraq, Afghanistan. No declaration of war was ever given, unauthorized. These were acts taken on by the executive branch and the expansion of powers, which uh, is, is a discussion for another night of the executive branch, um, have led to these foreign interventions. And we talk about what Washington said in his farewell address, to beware of foreign entanglements, as we should be now with the situation happening in Ukraine. So there are the enumerated responsibilities. Let's, let's hear what James Madison has to say. The father of the Constitution. The Federalist Papers were written to convince, to convince skeptical electors and the de delegates that they send to state ratifying conventions that the new Constitution was necessary, and in particular, would not give the new federal government any more power than was absolutely necessary to carry out its responsibilities. The doctrine of enumerated powers, the main restraint on the new government, was the most famously stated by James Madison in number 45. The powers delegated, quote, this is the powers, quote, the powers delegated by the proposed constitution to the federal government are few and defined. Those which are to remain in the state governments are numerous and indefinite. The former will be exercised principally on external objects as war, peace, negotiation, and foreign commerce with which last the power of taxation will, for the most part, be connected. The powers reserved to the several states will extend to all the object, objects which, in the ordinary course of affairs, concern the lives, liberties, and properties of the people, and the internal order, improvement, and prosperity of the state. So we see that the federal government had few and defined enumerated responsibilities, as we just read in Article 1, Section 8. But yet the states had more um, flexibility in creating laws that would protect the lives and the liberties and the properties of the people and the internal order improvement and the prosperity of the state. Notice the words few and defined. The federal government was to have only limited responsibilities. Most power was to be left with the state governments. They were closer to the people who could then better control them. And that is the people controlling their state governments. James Madison's Federalist Number 14 said, quote, it is to be remembered that the general government is not to be changed with the whole power of making and administering laws. Its jurisdiction is limited to certain enumerated objects which concern all the members of the Republic, but which are not to be obtained by the separate provisions of any. Of course, we've seen the blurring of the lines between the three branches of government almost in uh, uh, undeterminable. You cannot determine determine what the responsibilities are anymore with the three branches of government. But yet uh, Madison talked about uh, the separate provisions of all three. And uh, it's getting back to implementing the structure of the constitution that is what is ultimately more important and what needs to be done more than any amendment. And that is those who will be faithful to the constitution and its structure. Madison argues there are certain things like national defense and foreign and national commerce that are properly national concerns since they are largely beyond the competence of individual states. 
In fact, one of the main reasons the framers sought to write a new constitution was because the Articles of Confederation afforded the federal government too little power to deal with such matters. The nature of man, and this is something that has been largely forgotten in today's society as propagated through our school systems and institutional uh, higher institutions of learning, the nature of man, of course, the progressive and the not and the Marxist, they don't believe in the nature of man. They believe man is in blank slate and can be um, indoctrinated into being a good subject of the state. But yet, this is not true because there is a nature of man. There is an inherent human nature. And we read of it, and that nature is fallen. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. That is all inclusive of everyone in the human race and who has ever been born in the human race. We also read that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That is, who can understand the depths of evil that exists in the heart of each one of us, as we read in Romans 3, 10 through 12. And listen to what James Madison said in reference to clearly reading and understanding these verses. He said, but what is government itself, but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? So that same depravity, my friend, is taken by the representatives into governance. The inherent selfishness, the inherent ego, the inherent uh, pride, uh, the inherent ostentatiousness, the inherent um, love of self, all of these natures, all of these attributes of the nature of man or demonstrated by anyone who is an elected representative and we, the people who elect them. When we vote for candidates, as many do throughout the nation, when we vote for representatives or continue to, sell, to give us subsidies and subsidize our, life, our lives from cradle to the grave, that is selfishness, that, that is a sin in itself. Um, that we are not taking responsibility for, but we want somebody else to do it for us. We want the government to do it for us. And this is why we have unjust legislation. This is why we have programs, endless amount of federal programs that have led to this call for a convention of the states. Let's get down to the heart of the matter. Let's get to the genesis of the situation. That is the inherent evil nature and depraved nature of man's heart. And we're all guilty of it. There is no diversity in this. This is all together, one and the same for every individual. And Madison understood that. This is why they provided checks and balances to combat the very nature of man as he would be in the House of Representatives or as a Senator or as the President of the United States or as a Supreme Court Justice. The checks and balances are there to check man's sinful pride in human nature. And until we understand until we understand that the problems that we have gotten or that we have received and continue to receive are because of the fallen nature of man. We've made great improvements over the, the several hundred years and, and even millennia. Uh, we, the technology is, is remarkable what we've been able to do. We, we've been able to go to the moon and back. We've put spaceships on Mars. We have tremendous means by which to um, communicate information, information technology, and the, and the, uh, the speed by which we can uh, transport information and the internet and the different protocols that we use in information technology and the great advancements is in science. We've been able to, in many ways, we're helping to cure cancer and uh, we've cured polio and diseases that were prominent uh, many, many decades ago, we've made all these tremendous improvements, but what has not been touched, what has not been touched and what cannot be touched is man's sinful, fallen human nature. There's only one 
repair to that nature, and only God can perform it. Only God can give you a new nature. And even though you'll continue to live in this body and continue to lust after sin, God gives you a new heart and new soul by which you don't want to be disobedient to God. And that is an example of how that human nature can be changed, but no school can do it. No ideology can do it. No philosophy can do it. Only God can change the minds and hearts of men and women. The Convention of the States. Concerns. Here are a list of concerns that we would have with a Convention of the States or a Convention, Constitutional Convention, which is essentially what it really is. A convention would, could write its own rules. The Constitution provides no guidance whatsoever on ground rules for a convention. They simply aren't there. There are no ground rules for a convention. The convention could set its own agenda, possibly influenced by powerful interest groups. The only constitutional convention in US history in 1787 went far beyond its mandate as we saw. Former Chief Justice Berger wrote, quote, a constitutional convention today would be free for all for special interest groups. He said this either in the 50s or 60s. Could you imagine now? Further, the broad language contained in many of the resolutions the states have passed recently might increase the likelihood of a convention enacting changes that are far more sweeping than many legislators supporting these resolutions envision. So you have to consider the powerful influence of interest groups in a modern day convention of the states and the agenda. Who's gonna set the agenda? All of these questions we've already asked, and there are no answers until the assembly would actually occur. A convention could choose a new ratification process like we saw in the 87, 1787 convention, ignored the, ran the ratification process under which it was established and created a new process, lowering the number of states needed to approve the new constitution and removing Congress from the process. A convention could choose a new ratification process. Indeed so, and though those who are purporting to, and supporting a convention, they say, oh no, it'll all be written out. Everything will be clear, cut and dry. Nothing can be further from the truth. No other body, including the courts, has clear authority over a convention. The constitution provides no authority above all that of a constitutional convention that the courts or any other institution could intervene if a convention itself to the language of the state resolutions calling for a convention. The courts would be out of the picture completely. And some people may say, well, that's a good thing. But there are instances when the courts are faithful to the Constitution. And this means, and by in this particular circumstance, the Constitution doesn't need to be changed or amended as it does to be obeyed. James Madison, again, in Federalist 55, said, in Federalist 55, facing critics' predictions of corruption in Congress, he observed that while there is a degree of depravity in mankind, human nature, we were just talking about that, weren't we? There's a degree of depravity in mankind, human nature, which requires a certain degree of circumspection and distrust. There are also other qualities in human nature which justify a certain portion of esteem and confidence. But then setting optimism aside, he warned, quote, Republican government presupposes the existence of these qualities in a higher degree than any other form. Where the pictures which have been drawn by the political jealousy of some among us faithful likeness of the human character, the, inter the inference would be that there is not sufficient virtue among men for self-government, that nothing less than the chains of depotism can restrain them from destroying and devouring one another. Madison knew that the Constitution could not be sustained if the country did not first sustain certain virtues of self-restraint among those who administer the government and among the people who choose them. Very important principle. James Madison said during the Virginia Ratifying Convention, June 20, 1788, quote, but I go on this great Republican principle that the people still have virtue and intelligence to select men of virtue and wisdom. Let me go back. He said, 
quote, that the people will have virtue and intelligence to select men of virtue and wisdom. Is there no virtue among us? If there be not, we are in a wretched situation. No theoretical checks, no form of government can render us secure. To suppose that any form of government will secure liberty or happiness without any virtue in the people is a chimerical, that is a ridiculous idea. If there be sufficient virtue and intelligence in the community, it will be exercised in the selection of these men so that we do not depend on their virtue or put confidence in our rulers, but in the people who are to choose them. And unfortunately, we have seen in our day, my fellow citizens, the lack of virtue and wisdom amongst the voters. This is why they have elected representatives some for special interest reasons, some, some for continuing subsidies being given by government rather than earned by the citizen, and a whole milieu of many, many different reasons why people vote for who they vote for, but the people have lost virtue and wisdom. A lot of it has to do with the exclusion of civics in our public education systems, but we can't use an excuse. We have to become educated ourselves. Abraham Lincoln did. He didn't have the benefit of a formal education. He read and read and read and read. That's why he became such a brilliant lawyer, statesman, president. And there is no excuse for us, even though civics have been eliminated. Well, the Constitutional Republicans, our organization, we're teaching civics to our citizens. Are you a member? Are you joining us? Are you helping us? I invite you to do so. Uh, we need to restore the virtue and the wisdom within the electorate so that they're electing representatives who have the same virtue and wisdom and will abide by the Constitution and therefore better protect exclusively the Constitution protects our natural rights. And that's what our representatives have to be faithful to and support. It's not their ideas. It's the Constitution's. We don't need change in the respect that we need to change from the Constitution. No, we need to restore the Constitution. I like the word better, restore, than I do change. The extracts from Thomas Jefferson to Charles Yancey and William Jarvis. Quote, if a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and what never will be. The functionaries of every government have propensities to command at will the liberty and property of their constituents, there's no safe deposit for these, but with the people themselves, nor can they be safe with them without information. January 6, 1816. Thomas Jefferson wrote to, in 1820, to William Jarvis's quote, he said, I know of no safe depository for the ultimate powers of the society, but the people themselves. And if we think them not enlightened enough to exercise their control with a wholesome discretion, the remedy is not to take it from them, but to inform their discretion by education. This is the true corrective of abuses of constitutional power. So it's the education that is needed more than an amendment or amendments. It's the education. And we have to understand that people will say, well, the founders put Article 5, Convention of the States, the second clause in there, or the second uh, alternative um, to amending the Constitution, the Convention of the States, in there for a reason. And it was because they wanted the people to... Uh, again, re um, reclaim or to put, uh, put stop gates on the federal expansion of powers. But yet, you have to remember that when the founders created the Constitution, they really believed that the people would, get, would be smarter than they were, that they would be more virtuous and more knowledgeable, that they would be much more educated in human nature and in the principles of government. And after all, they went back into history and did a survey of all governments and histories. And that's how they formulated this finest of all constitutional republics, republics because of their knowledge. And that is lacking today. That is lacking in our society. Let's be honest with ourselves. Let's not kick the can down any further down this road. We know that we are lacking in the knowledge and the intelligence and the virtue and the morality of the founding fathers. And that is even more reason why today we are ill-equipped to have another constitutional convention. 
this is something that's very important. And this is a quote from a man who is a fine president and who would have been a greater president if he wasn't murdered. And that is Republican James A. Garfield, who also served in the Union and fought in the Civil War. And he said that the people are responsible for the character of their Congress and no amendment. He didn't say that. This is actually the title that I gave that you must remember, the people responsible for the character of their Congress, no amendment can provide character. And that's true. And we're talking about human nature again, right? Character has a lot to do with no human nature. It's an aspect of human nature. Quote, now more than ever before, the people are responsible for the character of their Congress. If that body be ignorant, reckless, and corrupt, it is because the people tolerate ignorance, recklessness, and corruption. If it be intelligent, brave, and pure, it is because the people demand these high qualities to represent them in the national legislature. If the next centennial does not find us a great nation, it will be because those who represent the enterprise, the culture, and the morality of the nation do not aid in controlling the political forces, unquote. That was a speech he gave on the 100th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, July 4th, 1876. And if those words don't ring true today, no words would ever. Look at that statement, read it again, ponder it, contemplate it, share it with others, tell it to your children. He says that now more than ever, the people are responsible for the character of their Congress as they, have, as they always have been. And yet Congress has given abysmal opinion ratings approval ratings, abysmal. Well, if, if it's that abysmal, we only have ourselves to blame. If that body, if the Congress is ignorant, reckless, and corrupt, and who, who doesn't cor complain about corruption in government? I hear it every day from someone. It's too corrupt. I'm not going to get involved. I don't care. It's too corrupt. Well, the reason it's corrupt is because you've allowed it to be corrupt, it's because you've elected representatives that do not demonstrate moral and virtue and who do what they're supposed to in abiding by the Constitution. Tremendous, tremendous statement. That's something that we should be reading every day and to our children. And of course, we can't get by with this presentation as we wind it down to the fact that Abraham Lincoln and the Constitution, we have to have some quotes from Lincoln, don't interfere with anything in the Constitution. Quote, that must be maintained, for it is the only safeguard of our liberties. And not to Democrats alone do I make this appeal, but to all those who love these great and true principles. He said, let us then turn this government back into the channel on which the framers of the Constitution originally placed it. That should be on the mouth of every single Republican representative and Republican registered voter. That should be your that should be what you should, that is your statement. That is what you should be saying. Let us then turn this government back into the channel in which the framers of the Constitution originally placed it. Precisely what the New Jersey Constitutional Republicans are calling for. Precisely. Quote, I have borne a laborious and in some respects to myself a painful part in the contest. Through all, I have neither assailed nor wrestled with any part of the Constitution. Now, listen to this. Here is another Republican statement. Here is a statement that every Republican principal, every Republican representative should be declaring and Republican voter, <clears throat> quote, the people. The people are the rightful masters of both Congress and the courts. Not to overthrow the Constitution, but to overthrow the men who would pervert it. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so there you have it. There's nothing that needs to be done to overthrow the Constitution or amend its structure. But what needs to be done is to overthrow the men who have perverted it. And we've allowed them to exist in representative government for too long. American people must set a high standard, a high bar for those who they elect to their local, 
state and federal offices. And I also will say, President, we must expect a higher standard. We must expect a constitutionally literate, intellectually rigorous man or woman to serve as president of the United States. We have compromised for far too long. Lincoln said, I am exceedingly anxious that this union, the Constitution, and the liberties of the people should be perpetuated in accordance with the original idea for which that struggle was made. And I shall be most happily indeed if I shall be an humble instrument in the hands of the Almighty of this, his almost chosen people, for perpetuating the object of that great struggle, unquote. And incidentally, he said that on February 21st, 1861. I believe that's it should be February February 22nd. It was actually on, on George Washington's birthday that he gave that. That is actually a typo. February 22nd of 1861 in a speech that he gave in the New Jersey State House in the New Jersey Senate. Moving on, Article 6, Clause 3. <clears throat> now, this is what needs to be restored. This is much more practical than holding a convention with a big convention of states or a constitutional convention that'll just be one big question mark. I mean, you could literally get the Riddler to be the mascot for a convention, constitutional convention of the states, because you just don't know. It's a big question mark. Here is what is already in the constitution. And this is what we need to restore and to demand. We need to demand this from our elected representatives, people. That is, the senators and representatives before mentioned, the members of the several state legislatures and all executive and judicial officers, both of the United States and of the several states, shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution. But no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. So all elected representatives are bound by their oath to the or affirmation of the Constitution and to support the Constitution. And how many elected representatives have we allowed to get away with not abiding to their oath or affirmation to support the Constitution by proposing unconstitutional law? Now, I want to talk to you about what I would recommend everyone read, and which is a fine book written by Mark Levine, who many of you are very familiar with, and who has a television show on each week on Fox. He wrote a book called The Liberty Amendments. Now, Mark Levine is a supporter of the convention, Constitutional Convention, and uh, he writes an excellent book in describing many of the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> many of the predicaments that exist with the many uh, infringements and usurpations that the gov federal government has inflicted upon uh, our citizens. And I would say that he comes up with these amendments. He has 11, what he describes as liberty to amendments. And I support uh, every one of them with the, uh, with the exception of the first, which is to impose congressional term limits. Constitution already gives term limits of two years in the House of Representatives, six for senators, four for the president, and he is term limited to two, two uh, terms. Um, I believe that you're taking away the right and the will of the people in doing so. And I understand that there are a lot of people out there that are tired of Nancy Pelosi and want to get term limits in there to get her out. Well, guess what? What we're supposed to be doing is to run... Republican candidates, fine constitutionally Republican candidates to run against her <clears throat> and to convince the citizens and to, um, to influence the public sentiment on what just representation, what just government entails, and is certainly not what Nancy Pelosi affirms. So the key is winning elections and having good, solid, constitutionally literate intellectually rigorous candidates to go up against her. How about if we have a representative who is doing an outstanding job and wants to continue in service more than 12 years in the Congress? They're actually uh, calling for 12-year limits. 
for Senate and Congress. Well, how about if uh, we have uh, senators and congressmen and women who are doing an outstanding job and representing the natural rights of the people? You may not get that same quality. You may not get that same intellect. You may, you may not get that same obedience to the Constitution. Founders went to great lengths to make sure the term limits were part of it because they wanted the people to decide for themselves who their elected representatives, and they believed that it was undemocratic to limit the terms by which a person can um, serve. So we have number two, the repeal of the 17th Amendment. Absolutely, that gave the uh, direct democracy vote to our senators and eventually and, initially, and um, ostensibly took away the power of the states in the federal government and gave it to the federal government. Disastrous amendment, one of the, a lot with the 16th Amendment, two of the worst. And then, of course, imposing term limits for Supreme Court justices and restrict judicial review. <clears throat> that is a discussion that I would be willing to have uh, with someone who is purporting that. Uh, require a balanced budget and limit federal spending and taxation. Um, that, of course, makes perfect sense, but uh, it's very difficult now when you're at $30 trillion with your federal uh, and uh, deficit and you may and the, you always have the specter of war that you would have to do to deal with. So you have the proviso that would have to be included in the balanced budget amendment to uh, for extraordinary circumstances. But of course, the budget process, this is a whole different conversation for another night. The fact that the budgets aren't even proposed anymore and that they're not following the rules, um, the rules that they create themselves in the Congress. And uh, it all needs to be... Um, it all needs to be redressed and to be uh, restored and reformed. And obedience needs to be given the rules, but ex exclusively and, and extensively the constitution first. Uh, de to find a deadline to file taxes, subject federal departments and bureaucratic re regulations to periodic reauthorization reauthor review. How, who could argue with that? Create a more specific definition of the commerce clause. Absolutely, brilliant. Limit eminent domain powers. Absolutely, allow states for more easily to more easily amend the Constitution by, by bypassing Congress. Create a process where two thirds of the states can nullify federal laws and require photo ID to vote and limit early voting. Who wouldn't be in support of that? Unless you are a diehard neo-Marxist leftist Democrat who believes that the ends justifies the means, and that even means uh, election fraud. But all of these could be done through regular amendments. These are all regular amendments. We don't need a big question mark constitutional convention uh, to enact these. And I'm surprised that uh, Mark Levine, who's a very, very intelligent man and uh, one who I respect and have learned much from, um, and I support these amendments that he's proposing with the exception of the first one. And, um, but these all can be done through the regular amendment process. Uh, quickly, I want to go through nine myths uh, from the Convention of States project uh, that a uh, lady by the name of Judy Kaler <clears throat> put together. And uh, many of this, uh, some of these uh, myths uh, we've already discussed, the Convention of States is the only medicine. You hear this quite a bit, um, that the Convention of States is the only medicine that can, can cure the disease of federal overreach. That's false. But did our fathers really say we must do when the federal government usurps power? They never said when the federal government ignores the Constitution, amend the Constitution. Instead, in addition to electing faithful representatives, and that's the key that I focus on, electing faithful representatives, they advise nullification, excuse me, where powers are assumed but have no, not been delegated and nullification of the act is the rightful remedy. remedy as Thomas Jefferson said, Kentucky Resolution 1798. Now, there are those, and I am one of those, who uh, takes a more nationalist approach um, that uh, nullification has to be understood in lieu of Article 6, uh, Clause 2 of the Constitution, which gives the federal Constitution um, the rule of the right of supremacy, the supremacy clause, if you will. And if you'll allow me a moment to show you that, um, let me bring that up for you. Um, we're winding down, I promise, but I wanted to give you this information so that you're um, 
fully equipped to discuss and to um, contemplate these ideas on a convention of the states. Article six says, clause to this constitution, the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof in all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land. And the judges in every state shall be bound thereby anything in the constitution or laws of any state to the contrary, notwithstanding. So, uh, with the Legal Information Institute, Cornell Law says the supremacy clause regarding it, Article 6, Paragraph 2 of the U.S. Constitution is commonly referred to as the supremacy clause. It establishes that the federal constitution and federal law generally take precedence over state laws and even state constitutions. It prohibits states from interfering with the federal government's exercise of its constitutional powers and from assuming any function that are exclusively entrusted to the federal government does not, however, allow the federal government to review or veto state laws before they take effect. And uh, indeed, there you have the supremacy clause. And uh, we would look at that um, in lieu of what we read uh, regarding nullification. This is a, a discussion for a no whole other night. And uh, that is something that we would uh, look at. The 10th Amendment um, nullification is any act or set of actions that results in a particular law being rendered null, void, or even just unforceable within a particular area. Nullification applies only to unconstitutional acts of the federal government, to usurpations of power not delegated. States, local governments, your county sheriff, or even the people can follow the advice of James Madison, refuse to comply with unconstitutional federal laws right now without risking our constitution through a convention. In fact, there were over 200 bills introduced less than one month into the 2015 California state legislative season to do just that. And of course, none of them made it. But nullification is a debate and a discussion uh, that can be uh, had and we, we will do at another time. But I believe that it's more important to first elect the faithful representative and uh, have the citizens hold that representative faithful to the Constitution. But you can't hold faithful to what you don't know. And you have to know the Constitution and the principles of the Declaration of Independence with it. And then the myths continue on the purpose of an Article 5 is to protect the states and the people from an overreaching federal government. Amendments, quote, and this is false because amendments are meant to correct errors, not to protect the people from an overreaching federal government. Alexander Hamilton, the Constitutional Convention, September 10, 1787, pointed out that the amendments were remedy defects in the Constitution. He tells us in Federalist 85 that useful amendments would address the organization of the government, that is the structure, not the mass of its powers. So the idea of uh, limiting power through amendments, um, which of course was done in the 14th Amendment, the states were, uh, of course, on um, the federal government, uh, the states giving um, federal government, uh, giving the states um, the requirement requiring them to uh, give due process to all citizens and to the free slaves. Uh, up until the 14th Amendment, the federal government were those was the entity to be restricted. That changed with the 14th Amendment and uh, laws being given the states by the federal government. Of course, it was necessarily had to be done because of the Confederate and the slave, slave states. And you cannot fix federal usurpations of delegated powers by amending the Constitution to say the federal government cannot do what the Constitution never gave it power to do in the first place. Another very good observation. The reason the drafters added the convention method of proposing amendments to the Article 5 is to give the states a way to bypass Congress. That is a false, that is a false idea. If Article 5 were meant for states to bypass Congress, it would have bypassed Congress. Article 5 gives Congress the power to call a convention. In Article 1, Section 8, lost last cause gives Congress the power to make whatever laws are necessary and proper to carry out the powers vested by the Constitution. It is true that George Mason wanted the states to be able to make amendments without the assent of Congress and in a manner which did not depend on Congress. However, Mason lost on this issue and refused to sign the Constitution. 
Smith for a convention of states is different than a constitutional convention. We've already seen that that is not. She gives the exact same um, definition uh, that we gave through uh, Black's Law Dic Dictionary. Uh, they are one and the same. So when you hear someone say, well, the convention of the states is different than the constitutional convention, that is not true. It's just a means by which to uh, try to uh, garner adherence, garner those who would support the Convention of States. Nine minutes from the nine minutes, we continue on with number five. We know how an Article Five contention would operate. We've already discussed this. It's clear, and she uses the same information um, that I did uh, without even looking at her notes until today. I uh, added this today as part of the presentation. Uh, that the Congressional Research Service said that uh, nobody would know what would occur. Nobody can say what will happen in this convention until they actually assemble. That's a big question mark. And then number six, the reason we haven't had an Article 5 convention yet is because there have never been 34 applications requesting convention on the same topic. This is a speculation. Since Congress is given the power to call a convention, Congress decides how to count the applications, the hundreds of applications sent in thus far may not have met Congress's criteria in terms of wording, timing, or any number of factors, or perhaps Congress has resisted calling a convention for reasons of its own. Number seven, a limitation on the topic is necessary in order for state legislatures to provide instructions to the delegate. False. There's nothing in Article 5 that calls for instructions to delegates. Since delegates can do whatever they want once the convention is convened, delegate instructions serve only as a gimmick to secure legislative votes on applications by giving them a false sense of security and thinking they can control what is totally out of their hands or control. Now, I want to ask you a question. Could you imagine the state of New Jersey sending Cory Booker as our lone delegate? How about Bob Menendez? Shall we send Bob Menendez to our constitutional convention do we are we going to send these men who have ill or little regard for the constitution but believe in progressivism to the to the ninth degree if you will and this could, is a possibility and i've heard uh, others say well so what that's just one vote well how about some of the other states are they, is maine going to uh, send uh, susan collins who's going to vote for Justice uh, for, for uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, Judge Jack, uh, Jackson, who clearly uh, has a very, very um, suspect uh, philosophy of uh, judicial prudence. And then number eight, we have topics for an Article 5 convention can be limited to what convention delegates could not rewrite the entire constitution once they assemble. False, the delegates who represent we the people have the inherent right as expressed in the Declaration of Independence to alter or abolish the Constitution. This is a very good point and it's in the Declaration of Independence. We have the right to alter or abolish the Constitution. And those who could go into a convention, Constitutional Convention could reiterate that. We have the right to abol abolish and alter our Constitution. We're gonna do it in this convention. It's not out of the realm of possibility. Nobody can, can be restricted from saying that. And they can go back to the Declaration of Independence for the right to abolish and the right to alter the government and to alter the Constitution. Take that into consideration. This is why the Constitution needs to be protected as is. We can uh, propose amendments as we've seen uh, in this program. And then the last myth is there are adequate safeguards to place to assure state legislators are in control of a convention. Topics and limitations, the ability to recall delegates and the ultimate safeguard requires 38 states to ratify any ill-conceived or illegitimately advocated proposal. False. Delegates to an Article 5 convention would have no more power than the federal or state governments cannot be controlled by state laws. Typical topic. Limitations and delegate recalls may be ignored. Also, de delegates may make their proceedings secret as they did in at the Amendments Convention of 1787. And they may vote by secret ballot. If this happens, states won't know who is going on at the convention or what is going on at the convention. If the states don't know what is going on at the convention, then how will they determine whether to recall their delegates? or criminally prosecute delegates who violate their oaths to obey the instructions of their states. Remember that the first constitutional convention was done in secret. There was no press there. 
Everything that we know about the Constitutional Convention came afterward, um, primarily through James Madison's extraordinary notes, which I hope to get a copy of very soon. I would suggest you may be interested in looking at those notes yourself if you are still with me and paying attention to this presentation. And as we wind down, uh, I would direct you to a fine video that you can see on YouTube, the practicality and desirability of an Article 5 convention. It's one of the best debates that I've seen in doing research. Dr. Larry Arn, the president of Hillsdale College and Michael Ferris, chancellor of the Patrick Henry College. Michael Ferris is an ardent proponent of the Convention of the States. Michael Ferris is a man I have a tremendous amount of respect for. Um, I believe in a lot of uh, what he has taught and said over the years. I do disagree with him on the Convention of States, but he is a worthy um, intellect and academic, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for him. And you will hear a fine debate between these two men. It does get uh, even a little bit uh, heated, um, but uh, Dr. R makes three very, very important considerations. Number one is that the consensus about the nature of man and his rights were better grasped by the founders. Now, I've already discussed that. But you also have to remember that the founders agreed on almost everything. There are certain things, um, the anti-federalists and the federalists had some disputes on the Constitution, but they are minimal compared to the, to the divisions that we have in worldview, in political theory, in philosophy that we do in today's world. And with... Um, with other others today, with the, even within our own families, even within our own parties. Uh, there are many factions. Um, there was not that eplubious unum um, uh, spirit or personality, if you will, um, <clears throat> as with the fathers today. That has been obliterated. Now it's truth is in the eyes of the beholder. We believe in relativism. We are going through the... Um, um, effects of modern day postmodern thinking, the residual effects of postmodern thinking, which there is no truth. Um, all is Niles, all is nihilism, and that the uh, truth is in the eyes of the beholder. So it would be very, very difficult to get a constitutional convention made up of like minds today. Uh, could you imagine um, uh, having um, Ocasio Cortez and the squad? and um, the representative from uh, Michigan, um, Tlaib, and some of the others who are very, very, even prejudiced in their views, especially against uh, the very anti-Semitic in much of their language. Could you imagine them having influences on a constitutional convention? And then number two, the process has been tried many times and never succeeded. And this is true. It's never been done before. You're going into uncharted waters. And then the number three, the structure and the operation of the Constitution was better understood by the founders. And that is certainly true. Founders, of course, devised this government. And we, those who are today, uh, who actually criticize this structure and are looking for a more progressive or Darwinian view, a changing, evolving, organic view of the Constitution and law is very, very different from what the founders understood. So with that said, uh, you can clearly see that um, the James Madison and George Washington both um, thought that the Constitution and, and the convention and the Constitution derived from that. Constitution was indeed a miracle and uh, miracles often don't happen twice. Washington said, appears to me then little short of a miracle that the delegates from so many different states, which states you know are also different from each other in their manners, circumstances, and prejudices, would unite in forming a system of national government so little liable to well-founded objections. And of course, we were just talking about a lot of the common denominators that the founders had and that Washington is... Uh, indicating some of the differences, but those differences are minuscule compared to the differences that exist between potential delegates to a constitutional convention in 2022 or 23. James Madison said, quote, the real wonder is that so many difficulties should have been surmounted and surmounted with unanimity, almost as unprecedented as it must have been unexpected. It is impossible for any man of candor to reflect on the circumstance without partaking of the astonishment, 
It's possible for a man of pious reflection not to perceive in it a finger of the almighty hand, which had been so frequently and signally extended to our relief in the critical stages of the revolution. And here we have the founding fathers. They're not around anymore. They wouldn't be able, George Washington would not be presiding over another constitutional convention. And could you think of anyone better to do so? The man who led by example in all things, not only by word, but in an example. Remarkable man, the, truly the father of our nation. Irreplaceable and unmatched, all these men. We wouldn't have someone with the intellect of um, Alexander Hamilton or the brilliance of Benjamin Franklin, great legal minds like uh, Jonathan uh, Jay um, and um, John Adams, of course, uh, Thomas Jefferson with the Declaration of Independence. And as we wind down, uh, the bottom line is uh, this, there's just too much risk for too little gain. Um, the Constitutional Convention would uh, put everything at risk and for the three, amendments that the um, Convention of States are looking to promote um, can be done through the amendment process uh, through the Congress. And uh, that would be the safer route. They wouldn't be rewriting a constitution to amend it. That could possibly happen with a convention, constitutional convention. So too much risk for too little gain. So the reason that people gravitate to this movement and it's interesting that in the past that it was, it was relatively more liberal or leftist um, thinkers that were promoting this constitutional convention. And yet um, it was quickly discovered that uh, they, it would need, be needed, it would be more advantageous to get grassroots and conservative organizations involved with promoting a constitutional convention. And that's precisely what we've seen with the Convention of States project. Can you imagine all the money and all of the uh, um, all of the effort, all the money and effort that's been used in promoting this constitutional convention? And people want a plan of action. They want to do something. They see that there are injustices, and Mark Levine brings them all out in his uh, book, The Liberty Amendments, which I highly recommend. And everyone wants something done. And we want instant gratification. That's the society we live in, instant pudding. We love it. But yet uh, the founders understood that it was more deliberative. It took longer to create law. It took longer to do things. More thought is involved. Uh, sleeping on it. You ever heard the expression, sleep on it? When you want to make a rash decision, it, it works. Try it. But here are the, this is the plan of action. This is the constitutional plan of action that it'd be far more effective than a convention of a constitutional convention. Number one, educate the citizens and the representatives that come from them on the political theory of the American founding and the government derived from the principles of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution that protects those principles. So number one, education. Number two, hold elected representatives accountable to their oath in supporting the Constitution. We read it with Article 6. Article 6 should be branded all over for, for representatives to see as they walk into the State House. Article 6 is there. As the people are meeting with their representatives, as they go to campaign um, rallies, there's Article 6 being blazing colors, supporting and defending the Constitution. That's what needs to be restored, number two. And then call for amendments that are just and impactful through the means by which all amendments have been exclusively passed throughout our history. We've proven that it works. We've only had a couple of amendments that are, uh, have been uh, unfortunate, but uh, the amendments do work. And that's the process by which we should mean. And we wouldn't put a, our constitution in jeopardy of being rewritten again. And these are feasible means by which to do it. A lot of people want the instant gratification, but guess what? There is none. You have to work. We have to work hard. And we have to work in educating the citizens and our representatives that come from them. Hold the elected representative accountable to the Constitution. Any legislative proposal must be uh, constitutionally, um, must be given constitutional authority. It cannot be it must be commiserate with the Constitution. It can't contradict the contra Constitution. And then to call for amendments 
through the traditional means. And all of those that we saw with Mark Levine are fine amendments. I only disagreed with the one. So that uh, concludes the portion uh, that concludes the presentation. I know I have a tendency to be long winded. That's an hour and a half, but there's a lot of information there. And I hope you'll go back and you will, um, you will review it and you will share with others um, all about uh, what we've been discussing. And uh, let me see if I can uh, bring up, um, doesn't look like I'm going to be able to, to get the question uh, portion of the program up that I wanted. Um, let me give it, uh, and there is, there is the live program, but that's from the beginning. And that's where it will start for me. And um, I will conclude the program now. Uh, any questions, you can email me, njcr4restore at uh, gmail.com. And uh, there you will be able to ask any questions. Please share this video. Please go to our YouTube channel and subscribe. Uh, I really need the help of all of you out there listening and viewing. Um, we need to create a movement. We need to garner as many people as we can into the constitutional Republican family so that we can educate, restore, and um, preserve our Republic, which is under assault. Uh, but again, I do thank you very much uh, for joining me this evening. And uh, we will be having a New Jersey Constitutional Republicans virtual conversation on Wednesday evening at eight o'clock with Elizabeth Nader of NJ First TV. And uh, she's having an event called a Seat at the Table in April this, this month, April the 28th. And she will have a lot of nationally known figures there. And it is an will be an excellent opportunity for those to network. I'm looking forward to going. I'd like to talk to some people. I'd actually like to talk to the Schlapps about their participating in CPAC next year and giving an invigorating speech. So thank you very much for joining me this evening. And remember what Lincoln said, liberty to all. <laughs>